Welcome everybody. I would like to talk about chapter 17 of the Krugman Obstfeld Mehlitz textbook. The topic is output and the exchange rate in the short run. Let's start with the outline of the model, the assumptions and the equilibrium conditions. I would like with some to start with some introductory remarks. So when you look into the textbook, uh, the version of the model we are going to use is like the long-term version of the model presented in the Krugman Obstfeld Mehlitz textbook. And we will only consider permanent policy changes. So we will exclude the temporary changes in the lecture, but maybe when you read this book chapter, it will be necessary that you also read the temporary parts so that in the end you understand the permanent policy changes. To some extent, I think that this is already a paradox, like uh, chapter 17 says output and the exchange rate in the short run, but it uh, seems to be the case that there is also a long-term version of this model. Therefore, I departed a little bit from the textbook. Let's have a look at the assumptions. Um, what is very important is to understand the net export function. Net export is defined as exports minus imports. It is the case that we assume that exports depend in a positive way on the real exchange rate. So the real exchange rate is given by the nominal exchange rate times the foreign price level P star divided by the domestic price level P. So in case that the real exchange rate increases, exports will increase. Exports also depend on the foreign GDP level Y star. So for example, we are looking at the European economy and in case that the foreign GDP like the American GDP increases, then the Americans will import more. The imports of the US are the exports of Europe and hence European exports will increase in case that the American economy is running and American GDP is increasing. Net exports implies that we have to subtract the imports uh, imports depend in a negative way on the real exchange rate. So in case that the real exchange rate increases, then um, foreign goods uh, become more expensive and therefore imports decrease. Furthermore, it's also the case that there is a positive relationship between imports and the domestic GDP. So in case that the domestic GDP is up, then um, imports will increase. In the third equation, you can see the very specific net export function we are going to talk about. It is a linear version of the net export function. So we assume that net exports depend on the autonomous component of next net exports. Um, for example, in case that there is a general shift of demand from the US towards Europe so that everything equal, the Americans are importing more from Europe, then net export NX0 would be positively affected and NX0 would increase. We said that the imports depend positively on domestic GDP but there is a negative sign in front of um, um, the import function in equation number two. And therefore, we have a negative relationship between net exports and the domestic GDP. In case that the domestic GDP increases, imports increase and therefore net exports are down. There is a negative sign in front of NX1. Then there is a positive relationship between net exports and the foreign GDP level. So in case that foreign GDP increases, 
uh, net exports increase, there is a positive sign in front of the NX2 parameter. Furthermore, we said in case that the real exchange rate increases, then it will be the case that exports increase, imports decrease, so that there is a positive relationship between net exports and the real exchange rate. There is a positive sign in front of the parameter NX3. So all the parameters like NX1, NX2, NX3 in itself are positive, but for example, with respect to the effect of domestic GDP on net exports, there is a negative relationship, and this is indicated by the negative sign in front of the parameter NX1. Let's have a look at the equilibrium conditions of this model. So the first equation, this is the goods market equilibrium condition. On the left-hand side, we have goods supply. And on the right-hand side, there is goods demand. Goods demand depend on consumption. So the consumption part, this is C0 plus C1 times Y minus T. So consumption depends on the autonomous component of consumption, C0, plus the marginal propensity to consume, C1, and then in brackets, disposable income, the gross income Y minus taxes. Demand for domestic goods also depends on investment. The investment function is given by B0, the autonomous component of investment, minus B2R. So once more, investment depends in a negative way on the interest rate and the negative sign in front of B2 indicates this relationship. Government spending plays a role and then we have the net export function as was defined in, on the previous slide. So in the closed economy setting, Demand for domestic goods only depend on consumption, investment, and government spending. And here on top, we have the exports and we have to subtract the imports. The money market equilibrium condition is the same as in the closed economy. The left hand side, this is real money supply, and the right hand side is real money demand. M over P is real money supply. And then real money demand depends on the autom autonomous component of money demand, D0. Money demand depends in a positive way on domestic GDP plus D1Y. This stems from the transaction motive. And then money demand depends in a negative way on the domestic interest rate. Um, this is due to the fact that the opportunity cost of holding money will increase in case that the interest rate increases. The last equation uh, indicates that the domestic interest rate is equal to the foreign interest rate, R is equal to R star. We can call it the UIP condition, or it also indicates that a small economy which has complete capital mobility has to have the same interest rate as the foreign economy. R is equal to R star. When we look at equation number one, it is the case that on the right hand side, um, two elements depend on domestic GDP. So consumption depends on domestic GDP because of the fact that the marginal propensity to consume is linked to the domestic GDP. And then also the imports uh, depend on domestic GDP. On the next slide, I would like to come up with a numerical example and explain in detail why equation one is formulated in this way. Let's assume in this numerical example that C1 is equal to 0.6, so the marginal propensity to consume is equal to 
This implies that in case that uh, GDP is up by one unit, consumption will be up by 0.6 units. So in case that GDP increases by one euro, then uh, domestic consumption is up by 60 euro cents. Uh, NX1 takes the value of 0.1 and it indicates that in case that GDP increases by one unit, imports will increase by 0.1 units. Let's go through uh, the different elements on the slide. So the first bullet says that in case that GDP increases by one euro, private saving is up by 40 cents due to the fact that the marginal propensity to save 1 minus C1 is equal to 0.4. Furthermore, consumption will be up by 60 cents, like C1 is equal to 0.6. We have to consider that consumers demand domestic goods and foreign goods. The big question now is, by how much does demand for domestic goods increase? In case that GDP increases by 1 euro, demand for foreign goods is up by 10 cents, because NX1 is equal to 0.1. Therefore, we can compute that the demand for domestic goods is up by 60 cents minus 50 cents is up by 50 cents. C1 minus NX1 is equal to 0.6 minus 0.1 is equal to 0.5, so that in case that GDP increases by one unit, the demand for domestic goods will increase only by 50 cents. I hope that this numerical example uh, clarified the difference between these two parameters the difference between C1 and NX1. On the next slides, once more, you can see all the different parameters. Um, I don't want to go into detail, but what is very important is that you know whether one term is like a parameter an endogenous variable or an exogenous vari variable. This is very important because we always assume that the parameters are constant. Parameters do not change. Uh, this uh, will be very important in case that we have to compute, for example, a total differential, because when we compute a total differential, we assume that the parameters are constant, parameters do not change, Therefore, we don't have to differentiate with respect to the parameters. It is the case that we were looking at three equilibrium conditions, three equations. And when we have three equations, then we can also solve for three endogenous variables. The variables which are endogenous here is uh, the domestic GDP level, income, or output, the y variable. Uh, this implies that we are not producing at the capacity constraint. It implies that we are in the Keynesian depression and it is the case that uh, unemployment rates are pretty high. So we are assuming that we have very, very high unemployment rates. Unemployment rates are 25% we are not producing at the capacity constraint. And therefore, in this chapter, we want to find out whether the one or the other policy is able to increase GDP. This would be very important because when GDP is up, employment is up and the unemployment rate is down. So the GDP level Y is an endogenous variable. Then also the domestic interest rate is an endogenous variable, but due to equation three, the domestic interest rate can only change in case that the foreign interest rate changes. Then 
the other endogenous variable is the nominal exchange rate because in chapter um, fifth, in chapter 17 we assume that we are in a floating exchange rate system and therefore the nominal exchange rate is an endogenous variable. All the other variables are exogenous. So C0, B0, Annex0, D0, they are exogenous. Taxes, government spending, exogenous. Money supply is an exogenous variable under control of the central bank. The domestic price level, foreign price level are exogenous variables. This implies that the domestic price level cannot change endogenously. So this model is not able to explain inflation. Great. Uh, let's check what we want to do next. Um, on slide number 11, you can see that we want to work in a diagram where we put the one endogenous variable, like the exchange rate on the vertical axis, and the GDP level on the horizontal axis. In order, when we, when we want to find out whether the one or the other equilibrium condition and the one or the other equilibrium curve has a positive or negative slope, we always need to know what kind of variable is displayed on the vertical axis and which one is displayed on the horizontal axis. The exchange rate is on the vertical axis, y on the horizontal axis. So when we compute the slope of a curve, we have to compute dE dy. Let's check how we derived at this relationship. I'll go back to slide number 10. So we started with the goods market equilibrium condition. Then it is the case that we are inserting r is equal to r star in the investment function. So in the first equation here, you can see that uh, the term in the investment function is minus b2r. And in the next step, it is minus b2r star. So we are inserting this relationship here, equation number three, r is equal to r star in the goods market equilibrium condition. This is the reason why this curve is called ISZZ curve. So we are combining equation one, IS, with the third equation, ZZ, and therefore equation number four and the resulting curve will be the ISZZ curve because we are combining two equations. Furthermore, we assume that the domestic price level is equal to the foreign price level and we normalize both price levels to one. Uh, this is uh, a very nice step because then we can get rid of this fraction here and we only have to deal with the nominal exchange rate and not with the real exchange rate anymore. Uh, this assumption is justified because of the fact that we assumed that goods prices are exogenous. We will more or less assume that goods prices are constant and therefore this assumption is justified because we can get rid of the two price levels. As I mentioned before, we want to compute the slope of the ISZZ curve in this exchange rate income diagram. Therefore, we have to compute DE dy. And uh, hence, it makes sense in the first step to, to solve this equation for the exchange rate level, because then it's very easy to compute this derivative. So what we are doing now is we keep nx 3 e on one hand side of the equation and we put all the other terms on the other hand side of the equation. So when we put, for example, C0 on the other hand side, it pops up here with a negative sign. When we put plus C1, Y minus T on the other hand side of the equation, it pops up with a negative sign. Also here, when we put plus nx2 y star on the other hand side of the equation, it pops up with a negative sign on the other hand side of the equation. 
Afterwards, we divide this relationship by NX3 and we have isolated the exchange rate on the left-hand side of the equation. Now it is very easy to compute the differential DE dy when we differentiate with respect to y it the result will be 1 minus c1 plus nx1 divided by nx3 this is performed on the next slide so we have differentiated the equation with respect to y and then we get the slope of the curve is equal to 1 minus c1 plus nx1 divided by nx3. This relationship is larger than zero because of the fact that we assume that c1 is positive but between zero and one. c1 is smaller than one so that one minus c1 is positive. All the other parameters are all positive so that the ISZZ curve in this diagram has a positive slope. When does the IS curve shift? The IS curve will shift to the right in case that one variable changes that will cause an increase in the demand for domestic goods. Therefore, the ISZZ curve shifts to the right in case that C0 increases, B0 increases, government spending increases, autonomous component of uh, net export increase or in case that foreign GDP increases. And the ISZZ also shifts to the right because demand will increase in case that the tax rate decreases or in case that the foreign inter interest rate decreases. The ISZZ curve does not shift if the exchange rate or the output level change because these variables are displayed on the vertical or the horizontal axis. Let's switch to the money market equilibrium condition. Money market equilibrium condition was given in equation 2 left hand side real money supply right hand side real money demand now we assume that the goods prices are equal to one then the left hand side uh, of the money market equilibrium condition will just become one we also use equation number three r is equal to r star and insert the foreign interest rate r star in the money market equilibrium condition so that we arrive at equation number five. Also here, we are combining equation number two with equation number three, and therefore the resulting curve is LMZZ, because like the LM part, this is equation two, the ZZ part, this is R is equal to R star, equation three, and the resulting curve is LM. That's it. You can directly see in equation 5 that uh, equation 5 does not depend on the exchange rate. Um, the LMZZ curve will be a vertical line. There is only one level of GDP so that this equilibrium condition holds. The LMZZ curve is a vertical line. This is displayed here on slide number 14. Once more, we have to think about the shifts of the LMZZ curve. Uh, the LMZZ curve will shift to the right in case that nominal money supply increases, in case that the good price decreases, in case that the autonomous component of money demand decreases, or in case that the foreign interest rate level increases, then the LMZZ curve has to shift to the right. The LMZZ curve does not shift if the exchange rate or the output level change. 
This is the case because the two variables are displayed on the axis and we can move on the same LMZZ curve in case that one or the other variable changes. But the LMZZ curve shifts to the right in case that one of these variables change. In the following, we would like to know how an expansionary monetary policy or an expansionary fiscal policy is digested, whether it's possible to influence GDP by performing an expansionary monetary policy or an expansionary fiscal policy. What we of course do is uh, we bring together the LMZZ curve and the ISZZ curve within one diagram and then we have, uh, we have computed the um, initial equilibrium level here in this point A where the ISZZ and the LMZZ curve intersect. There we have found the equilibrium GDP level and the equilibrium level of the foreign exchange rate. But let's make a short cut here and I'll get back to you in another step.